Hello, everyone. It's good to see you here. We're going to get started as promptly as possible because I want to give the, our wonderful panelists as much time as possible. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Joe Tiffany, and I am the Senior Director of Education for the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, I oversee our education programs, which are K-12 and college-level programs where we educate students about energy, energy efficiency, engage them in hands-on projects that save energy on their campuses, and also influence the campus communities to save energy as well. I'm honored, truly honored, to serve as moderator for this esteemed panel of energy efficiency leaders who have achieved enormous success in making their universities more efficient and who continue to work each day to make them still more efficient. I'm very excited to hear their presentations and I believe all of us will learn a great deal from them. After they've presented, I'll invite you to ask questions and engage in what I hope will be a lively and enriching discussion about how to make universities models of energy efficiency in our country. So if you think of questions as each presenter goes, jot down, jot down your question if you wouldn't mind holding it to the end, and then you can direct your questions to whomever makes sense to you. Without further ado, let me introduce the panelists to you. Uh, they have requested that I not give their bios to save time. You will find their bios in your conference program, so please do take a look. They're quite impressive. I will give names and titles, however. <laughs> uh, starting out with Dirk Van Ulden, who is the Associate Director of Energy and Utilities for the University of California system with the Univer UC Office of the President. Next to him is Jared Isaacson, who's energy an analyst with San Jose University. Next to Jared is Joe Stagner, professional engineer and is executive director of sustainability and energy management right here at Stanford University. And last but certainly not least, and I'm not forgetting you, Joe, <laughs> is Joe Sugg. Uh, and he is Assistant Vice President of the University of, Op uh, of University of Operations at Santa Clara University. Please welcome the panelists, and we'll get right started with Dirk. <clears throat> oh, Let's see if this worked here. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, I have a couple of friendly people in the audience, so uh, they're going to, if anything happens, they're going to protect me. Um, as Joe said, I'm Dirk from Olden, the uh, Associate Director for Energy Utilities and Office of the President. Uh, Office of the President, nobody knows where we are, I guess. We are in Oakland, and it's uh, essentially the business office for the university system. Um, I will go over some details. What I want to talk about today is not actually technologies, but more the planning that goes into uh, getting a university system like ours to um, start reducing energy use and why they're doing that. And just like the summit that you're attending today, it takes quite a bit of planning, uh, but it can produce tremendous results if you do the planning right. This one here. So for, as far as the University of California is concerned, we were actually driven by a few things. We have a sustainability practices policy in place that dictates uh, certain energy reduction goals by certain dates. Um, the energy efficiency side is part of that. Uh, you know, Joe is going to be talking about a uh, different subject, but um, I will just talk about energy efficiency for the University of California. Uh, we have the goals that you can see on the slide here that after 2020, we'd like to become uh, carbon neutral as soon as possible. We believe that energy efficiency may contribute maybe a third to that. The other two thirds, we have to worry about some other. Uh, initiatives. But energy efficiency also, of course, reduces our operating expenses. Um, the uh, UC, CSU and UC in the newspaper all the time, we're getting 
shorter and shorter or, or lesser and lesser contribution from the state to operate our university system. So this really helps our budgets as well. So how do you, how do you actually do that? So we have, you know, it's a large system. Uh, but you have to bring all these people in. The students were actually the ones that started the whole process by saying, wait a minute, you know, this university is uh, wasting a lot of energy. We're not really green enough and we don't want to attend anymore. Yeah, you would think that everybody wants to be at UC, but apparently some people don't. The faculty uh, is also, it's a newer generation. They're looking for um, you know, a place where they feel very comfortable with the environment and that we are responsible with those resources. Then you have the staff. Uh, th those are the people who run our laboratories. Laboratories are a very important part of our campus system. Um, they're very concerned about energy efficiency because they think we're going to turn the lights off and you know no more ventilation and all that so that ruins their uh, their experiments and all that so then security uh other than at uc davis most other uh, campuses are very careful with that they didn't want any uh, light reduction uh another big issue for them then senior management they said wait a minute we can't afford this stuff because implementing this is very expensive so how, how do we go about that Lastly, it was the Board of Regents. You know, they are appointed by um, and approved by the legislature mostly, and then there's political connections there, and there's a lot of pressure. Hey, what's the university doing about energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reductions? So, that's quite a tall order, you can imagine. So how do you do this while uh, reducing operating expenses? So, we, we have an answer. It's very costly, you can imagine. Um, how do you do that? Just to give you a brief overview of what the university is all about, it's currently a $21 billion enterprise, which is, uh, if you look at uh, corporations in California, and we're, we're right up there, we're larger than, for instance, PG&E or uh, Southern California Edison. We're also not a state agency. We are a, uh, we're chartered by the California uh, um, <clears throat> Constitution, and we call ourselves the fourth branch of government. It helps us sometimes, it hurts us sometimes. So we have 10 campuses and five medical centers uh, and about 50 uh, field stations. Those are our agricultural people. The utility bill is about $250 million a year. We consume about 1.8 billion kilowatt hours. And all this information, I believe, is going to be on the website, right? so you may not need to take all notes here. Um, and 140 million therms per year. That's mostly used, actually, in our cogeneration facilities. And as I mentioned, a little asterisk here, we generate about 30% of our own energy to different campuses. Um, 120 million square feet of space, um, over 5,000 buildings all over the state. And a lot of these buildings are more than 100 years old. So you can imagine what challenges we have there. The campuses also, at least I'll tell you that, uh, they're autonomous. So the chancellors are kind of run their own show. So we cannot really dictate anything from the office of the president. So we have to do everything through persuasion and uh, leveraging and blackmailing, whatever it takes. Um, then the medical centers, uh, you hear about them, that's say UCSF in our case, and that's nearest. Uh, they're not state supported at all. Those are actually major uh, profit centers for the university system. Um, so we developed a plan starting in 2007. I was actually hired for that by the university uh, and we got that from our angel investor, which was uh, Enron, uh, in the settlement that we that was reached. Cost us $1.7 million to come through all the campuses and medical centers and look for projects. Uh, then we started leveraging all these different people that we needed to bring on board, and that's where the term partnership comes from. And that's uh, the various utilities in the state, the investor-owned utilities. It's uh, Edison down south, uh, PG&E, the gas company down there, and then San Diego Gas and Electric. We brought in facility management because these are the people who have to implement all the projects. The budget officers, they are the ones that have to approve the project, if they're, you know, make sure they're financially feasible. Uh, our chief financial officer staff, they had to go out there to the bond market to eventually finance these, these projects. And then the State Department of Finance, even though the state only contributes something like 5% to our budget at this point, they're still uh, keeping an eye on how we spend our money. So that's kind of a sore issue, but that's what we're dealing with. Um, this, is the, this is essentially the layout of our campuses and how the utilities are serving us. And the, the utilities are actually our major partners in this uh, particular endeavor. Um, 
So we published the uh, strategic energy plan in 2009. We uh, had identified at that point $950 million worth of projects. The campuses then, they went through it with a fine tooth comb, most of the budget officers, make sure that they made sense. And they came up with $247 million worth uh, in, in a cycle that would span from 2009 through uh, 2012. No, uh, 11, excuse me, three years. And then overall, the uh, payback would have to meet that requirement that I'm showing here. And we back, went back to the regions, said, this is what we have, this is what campuses will do. They authorized $178 million in external financing, which is bond, uh, revenue bonds. The utilities, by then, they had seen our project list, and they said, you know what, we'll kick in up to $61 million. That's all four of them. And then the campuses said, we have a couple of bucks also. So they kicked it in here. Uh, the implementation itself is done through the uh, utilities. It's our partnership program, which actually provides for a third-party review system, which was required by the bond underwriters. They didn't want to just take our word for it. They said, no, no, we need some third-party people. And that's mostly MCOR and uh, Arup and some other engineering companies in this area. Um, so we were... We have to go through the state, and I won't bore you with this too much, but there are some uh, very tricky po points. We have to go through the, through the legislature, actually, to get this authorized. So uh, there's a certain provision in the Budget Act, and there's one being signed here shortly uh, that seems to be recurring year after year. That's just for the University of California, where we can actually use operating uh, funds for uh, paying for capital projects. So that's a special uh, deal here. Um, then we have internal requirements. So we want to make sure that on a portfolio basis, we take all the projects together, that the debt service on the bonds that we are going to issue do, do not exceed 85% of the uh, avoided energy costs. That's a very important uh, criterion. And then we issue these bonds for 15 years at prevailing rate, which is a little under 4% currently here, tax-free bonds. So in, beginning 2009, um, Starting that date, we couldn't get the contract signed by the utilities right away, but you know, somewhere around May or June we started in 2009. We have done about $130 million worth of bond finance projects. Um, as you can see, we, uh, we have 600 some projects underway or completed. Uh, we are saving about 10% of our total system use on the electricity, about 8% of the gas use, and then uh, $30 million in avoided utility spend. So that is before that service. Uh, and the utilities, as far as I can tell from my records, have either paid or will be paying, have committed to about $51 million in incentives so far. Uh, what I'm not showing here is we have probably uh, created thousands of uh, green jobs in the process. All these engineers and contractors that have worked on these things. So uh, we haven't mentioned that too much, but every time you see the governor, we do mention it too. He's talking about green jobs. So, um, so we're counting on this program going forward, 2013-14. We are already in discussions, of course, with the utilities. We've talked with the P PUC about this, and we're talking to Sacramento just to make sure the funding will be available. So this is where we are. We'd like to go to some deeper savings. Uh, and we'll talk about technologies today, but uh, it's uh, pretty impressive what we have done so far. So I just wanted to let you know it takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of people. But if you get them all to dance together, then we can really produce some results. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I forgot I got my, I have a lot of contact information here. And again, this will be on the website. You can see all this stuff. Our strategic energy plans for each campus, each medical center, they're on this website. Uh, we have a working smarter program, which means we, are, we have committed to uh, reducing our operating expense by $400 million per year. This, this is a big part of that, obviously. And then uh, there's some other stuff there in my contact information if you have any questions. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> OK, and now Garrett uh, uh, Isaacson uh, will give his very quick presentation. Thank you. I'm uh, Jared Isaacson, uh, energy analyst at San Jose State University. So the content of this PowerPoint is going to be a little bit of background on the university, some information on our central utility systems, 
as well as energy efficiency projects, a little more specifics and kind of uh, project case studies. Uh, but a lot of it has the background that, that uh, Dirk mentioned about how uh, planning and, and implementation is is, uh, is run. So some campus facts. SJSU is part of the California State University, University System. It's the oldest of the CSU campuses. It uh, has been at its current site since the late 1800s. It has buildings ranging from 1910 to 2005, and some under construction now. now. The average building age is 40 years old, so that presents some challenges. It's uh, some aging infrastructure, some issues with, with maintaining facilities. We have two sites, the main campus, where all the academic administration buildings are, and the south campus, which is primarily athletics. That's where Spartan Stadium is located. And uh, SJSU is one of only a handful of those 23 state, uh, CSU campuses that does have a cogen. Uh, the campus, overall main campus, peak daily requirements around 9 megawatts, and the cogen unit's nameplate capacity is 6 megawatts. So some of the framework for our energy policy is a CSU executive order called 987. It incorporates a lot of the state mandates, uh, but its policy focuses on energy conservation, independence, uh, really promoting uh, on-site generation, as well as renewable energy. So in terms of uh, the system that we have at San Jose State, we have our source energy. It's energy that's fed to the central plant and then what's distributed to the campus buildings. The cogens combined heat and power, uses natural gas as a fuel, and it generates about two-thirds of the annual campus requirement, and that's in terms of KWH, not uh, KW, and steam production. Distributed generation, so one of the things I like to say, like to promote cogen, is that having the on-site generation, uh, avoid some of the line losses and, and transformer losses from transmission level power from distant merchant plants in the, in the valley where they're located uh, to urban centers like the Bay Area. So Cogen is also highly efficient. I'm going to get into a little more detail about our unit in particular. So here's a picture of the engine. It's a, now it's Rolls Royce. I think initially it was an Allison 501kh engine, uh, modified for stationary combustion, but these are aircraft type of engines. Uh, so we've got the turbine. The heat recovery steam generator, which is not pictured, it's kind of behind that. This is when we remove the engine. Um, and this is really what's the main part of this chain cycle of patent technology, the cogen that we operate, where we have injection steam, which not only increases the power and efficiency, but it also lowers our emissions in terms of NOx, SOx, and carbon monoxide. And uh, process steam generated by the, the unit is used for campus uh, steam loop for building heating as well as heating hot water, as well as absorption chillers. I wouldn't call this necessarily our system tri-generation, but it could be you know, configured in such a way it's tri-generation. Okay, so about our cogent, we had a consultant report, and uh, we were, were happy that uh, findings were that the net present value of the existing cogent is $15 million over its expected useful life, which is about 10 to 12 years. And that's even including the greenhouse gas to cost associated with AB32. And we expect to start having to participate in, uh, or we know we're going to participate in air resources towards cap and trade system. We're over the 25,000 metric ton uh, threshold, or about 30,000. And uh, so that's estimated 6.7 million over the next eight years. That's the best data we had. We had some estimates going out the life of the cogen, but it's kind of up in the air right now. It's, it's, it's very uncertain. Again, what Dirk talked about budget uncertainty, how is this going to impact our, our campus? Yeah, we, don't, we don't entirely know. Um, but nevertheless, a new equivalent plant, if we were to scrap this one, that was part of the consultant report, and install a new one, we'd still have a return of around 14%, which is very attractive, and something we're looking for in terms of, of cutting costs. If that's a IRR is a, a corporate uh, metric, but in terms of us, in terms of the state agencies, it's, it's cost avoidance, you'd call it. So then electricity. We actually have a high voltage electricity connection with PG&E, 115 kV. We're at an E20 transmission level rate, and uh, we operate our own substation. That supplements the cogen's power. 
we have a standby group of PG&E in case the project goes down uh, for maintenance and whatnot. And even during peak summer days, we're, we're uh, importing. And we operate our own 12 kV distribution system. So energy consumption. I kind of mentioned this before. We've got natural gas, high volts of electricity. That's what we're basing our carbon footprint on. That's tier one emissions. Then, from an energy management standpoint, though, we're also considering the outputs. Electricity, steam and therms, chilled water, and ton hours, and we create those to BTUs in terms of energy intensity units, and that's really more how we gauge our success in, in building energy efficiency. And we've we've done a lot. This is BTUs per square foot. You can see five, so that's more like seven years ago now, we're over 120,000 square foot. We had a big drop because we had a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, in our initial program with the utilities where we were receiving funding. And we're working on it, but it's it's more difficult. We've done a lot of the, the easy fixes, and now we're trying to get into deeper savings. Okay, just two left, okay. All right, so we'll run through this then. The partnership, uh, UC, CSU, IOU, universities, investor and utilities. To date, we've received $3 million in incentive funding in San Jose State. That's really aided our efforts quite a bit. Demand side management over that period, 9 million kilowatt hours saved, 200,000 therms, 1.6 million in utility costs, and that's around 15% uh, of our, our carbon footprint when we when we started at a, at a low cost. It's avoided consumption rather than uh, new generation. So here's a good project, one of our case studies. We got a best practice award from a University of Higher Education uh, Sustainability <coughs> Conference. It's a library, it's a joint library with the city. We had a monitoring-based commissioning project, which is a continuous commissioning type of project. Identified a lot, it's a fine tuning of a building that was really only three years old, but it gave us some money to do that. The lighting retrofit though was, was really big. Between these two, 25% energy reduction, big demand reduction as well, 5,000K lighting, occupancy sensors on the book stacks. It's a, it's a very large library, nine stories, 500,000 square foot, so it did a lot. Big savings, you guys can check it on the PowerPoint if you wanna read more into it. Um, so you can see the, the first three years, the first two, blue and, and the purple, Really high monthly energy, over 500,000 kWh per month. The, the yellow line is when those projects really started uh, coming online. And then after that, you can see big avoidance there, big big savings. So LEED, building was uh, LEED certified in January. Those energy efficiency projects really contributed to that. Energy performance, we got actually got an exemplary performance credit in materials and resources through toxic materials reduction in uh, lowering our Mercury per lumen. Um, some other things, we're using recycled water. It's a dual plumb building for toilet flushing as well as uh, for all the landscape irrigation outside. Daylight is big. Take a look at that. Uh, you can see all the windows. And then uh, the last project. Here's a current project. Chiller replacement. So we've got five chillers in our plant. Two electric centrifugal, two steam absorption, and one combination centrifugal ice maker and TES associated with that. We replaced the old chillers, probably got 20 year old chillers, increased capacity for new load. Um, not necessarily like ton of hours overall BTUs, but, but uh, increase in peak cooling mm -hmm. demand. And then much greater efficiency with VFDs, fewer refrigerant, more uh, environmentally friendly. Here's those chillers, they're York machines. This is a big deal, 3.7 million kilowatt hours and 290,000 save, uh, therms save, mainly because of how we're staging the sequence of operation with our absorptions. Big incentive, we're uh, really happy about that project and, and what, uh, what this really did for us, this uh, incentive funding, it really improved the scope of this project. We initially were talking about increasing capacity for cooling through adding another cooling tower, it wasn't gonna increase efficiency, so we're happy that the funding that we got really helped us have a, a more energy efficient solution than what we were initially planning in the scope. <clears throat> really quick, some challenges, budget constraints, huge time constraints, resources. Uh, projects are disruptive and they're inconvenient to the occupants, so it's it's a problem. And we'll with that I'm done. Thank you. 
There we go. Start at the beginning instead of the end. So thanks. As, uh, as Dirk and Jared mentioned, um, there's two big areas <clears throat> for university energy efficiency at reducing greenhouse gas. And the first is, of course, managing your demand. So building very efficient buildings and then retrofitting your existing fleet. So we, uh, we recognize that, and we have any number of programs uh, for doing that on Stanford, uh, from the Knight School of Management, Lead Platinum, to the New Science Engineering Quad, very efficient, and what we call the Whole Building Energy Retrofit Program that have done a lot. What I'm here to talk about today is our energy supply side, though. Uh, I agree with Dirk that, that the majority of the opportunity to reduce the environmental impact and improve the cost efficiency of long-term energy supply for a university is going to be in how you produce and deliver the energy to the buildings even though you've gotten the buildings very efficient. So uh, we've just culminated a three-year planning effort on what our uh, next long-term energy supply plan for Stanford will be. And it's resulted in a, a basically a half billion dollar transformation of Stanford's energy system that we call the Stanford Energy System Innovations Project. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit um, more about that. First, a quick overview of our existing system. Um, we have a 50 megawatt combined cycle cogeneration plant that serves Stanford's uh, heating and cooling needs and power needs since about 1987. Uh, the current contract for that, it's a third party owned General Electric plant and Stanford contracts for energy services from it. That plant's going to be about 28 years old in 2015 when the current contract expires. And so we've set about deciding what the successor strategy for that would be, whether to build a new cogen or do something different. Overall, that plant's about 53% efficient. Um, today's cogens are in the 60s, typically. I think San Diego's down in the mid-60s, and I don't know what San Jose and others are, but you can expect to get high 50s through you know, even uh, high 60s, depending on exactly how you're using the thing. Uh, but it is our basic big energy supply, so it accounts for 85% of our greenhouse gases. And some people don't know it uses one-fourth of our entire fresh water supply. All those cooling towers that are used for rejecting heat, waste heat, both from the cogen and from the chilled water system, consume quite a bit of water. Uh, you can probably see big plumes of condensate when you, know, when you uh, go by a university that has a cogen plant on a cold morning. That's all heat and water going to the atmosphere. <clears throat> and of course, the cogen plant delivers those services to the buildings via underground cables and pipelines. So you've got your electrical cables going out to power the buildings. You have chill water that, that's circulated around to cool the buildings, and you have, in our case, steam that's sent around the buildings for heating. Now, all of those uh, systems lose energy along the way, line losses, and steam particularly uh, loses a lot of energy. We have a very well-maintained steam system by a lot of standards, but we still lose 14% of the energy from the central plant to the buildings. Many universities and municipalities are well over 20% in the loss of that. You think of the old uh, manholes in Manhattan and the steam coming out, that's what it's from. It's loss of energy. And it also costs quite a bit to maintain our steam system. We spend over $2 million a year because there's a lot of mechanical devices, steam traps and pressure reduction valves and stations and so forth. So when we looked at a successor strategy for our current energy system, we of course realized that the campus is growing, so whatever we put in has to be able to be expandable. Um, we knew that we wanted something economic. Energy is very expensive. There's been a lot of volatility, especially in gas prices in the last decade. Maybe that'll settle down for a while with this gas fracking and these new supplies. But uh, we've all been brutalized in, in the first uh, decade of this century by the volatility in gas price. And water's going up. You know, just the water supply for the barrier, those prices are going up significantly as they have to retrofit the Hetch Hetchy system that brings most of the Bay Area's water from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way across the valley. And of course, sustainability. We wanted our new energy system to really um, look at all the available options, give us the maximum flexibility to adopt technology change over time to make things cleaner and more efficient. And so what we came up with, we call the Stanford Energy Systems Innovation System, and it will take us to about 2050 or beyond, really. So the core of this system, uh, you could think of uh, as another form of cogen. I'll call it the new form of cogen for us, and it's combined heating and cooling, not combined heating and power. When you think of a chill water system, it's really just a system for collecting heat from buildings. You're not delivering cold, you're really just collecting heat. Heat the buildings don't want. And you're collecting all that heat, taking it back to a central plant, 
and you're spending electricity and water to exhaust it to the atmosphere via cooling towers. So we took a look at uh, hour by hour at Stanford, how much heat are we collecting currently and exhausting out cooling towers, and in that same hour, how much heat are we sending out to the buildings via steam? And on the left, you can see a chart, which is a, a typical summer days chart. You can see it's the 24 hours on the bottom and the amount of energy up the y-axis. And so you can see what you might predict, that you know, at night it's cool here, and in the day it gets warmer and we have a lot of heat to reject. So that blue line shows how that cooling demand goes up in the day and then goes back down at night when we get these cool, uh, cool bay evenings. But we also have a fairly constant demand for heat. A lot of people don't know how uh, complex uh, research buildings and, and office buildings work, but when you have a big building with many different rooms and activities going on, they want to be at different temperatures. Computer server rooms want to be cooler than uh, classrooms that want to be different than office rooms and so forth. So buildings have what's called a, a building reheat or a zone reheat system, where if you make temperatures that are, say, 66 degrees at the main place where the cool air comes in the building and then you send it through ducts throughout the rooms, well, some rooms might want to be 68, some rooms might want to be 72 degrees, right, when you change that thermostat. So the way that's done is through little heat coils in the ceiling where the cold air comes through and you heat it back up a little. So if you got 66 degree air going into one space and another space, that same 66 degree air has to be cooled by little coils right above the ceiling called zone reheat coils uh, to make it, say, 72 degrees for this room. Well, that's heat. That, that's basically hot water flowing through those coils that then uh, has to be produced and delivered to the building in the first place. So that's how there's, uh, in, in many complex universities, uh, a constant amount of both simultaneous heating and cooling. So in our case, when we mapped that out for the whole year and looked at it, we said, look at that green thermal overlap. You know, that's how much energy we're low-grade heat, basically, we're collecting and wasting. And that's how much, at the same time, low-grade heat we're making with fossil fuel and then delivering. Why don't we see if we can use that heat uh, instead of producing it with fossil fuel. So let's see if we can reclaim that heat. When you look at it for the whole course of a year, you see the chart on the right. Uh, the top part of the uh, y-axis is our cooling demands. And this course in summer, you can see with the blue that we have more cooling demands. And in winter, we have more heating demands. Uh, but there's quite a bit of overlap. So the heat recovery potential you see there is that over the course of the whole year, we found that 70% of the waste heat we were collecting and, and currently wasting and discharging out cooling towers, we could actually repackage that as hot water and deliver it to the buildings and it would meet 80% of our annual heating demands. It's quite substantial. And so we set about um, examining that system and, and whether it'd be cost effective to do it. So we looked at nine uh, basic options, all the way from brand new gas-fired cogeneration plants based on gas and steam turbines, to the new internal combustion engines, uh, to combinations of cogeneration and heat recovery, to 100% heat recovery plant. And the one you see uh, circled there is the one that the university selected, and it's the one we've started building. And it's basically an option to move from being a 100% natural gas dependent campus for energy to being almost 100% electricity dependent. So we're going from gas to electricity almost like your car might go from gas to electricity in the future. And that's because electricity as a source, it's diversified. It's partly based on fossil fuel, but it's partly based on renewables and nuclear and other things. And that uh, electricity will get greener over time. We know it has to be 33% green by 2020. So in our long-term strategy, not only was moving from gas to electricity and from cogen to combined heat and cooling overall more energy efficient uh, and more economical, we believe it represents the best long-term path to be able to eventually move to full sustainability of our campus once we can work on getting those electricity supplies more sustainable and green. If we had bought a new cogeneration plant, we would be basically tied to gas again for the next 30 years and wouldn't have a lot of opportunity to adopt new technologies and clean up our portfolio. So the benefits of moving to this uh, electric heat recovery plant, we're using a lot of free heat, we're saving money in our operations and maintenance of our steam system by converting to hot water, and we're uh, reducing line losses. And we have some very significant environmental impacts. So we will cut our greenhouse gas emissions, our real, actual, category one and two greenhouse gas emissions by over half when this plant comes online. And it's primarily by more efficient equipment and, and reusing waste heat. 
So we'll be well ahead of California's so, goals and, and totally in a real good position to move to 100% sustainability <laughs> as we and or the grid clean up electricity supply. We'll save a lot of water. I mentioned the existing plant uses 25% of Stanford's fresh water. By not using wet cooling towers to exhaust all that heat into the atmosphere, we're saving that water. With heat recovery, you're not wasting that water. You're just taking the heat, moving it from one fluid stream to the next. So we'll reduce our campus water use immediately by 20%. There's a few other collateral benefits of getting away from steam. It's hot water is a much safer system for a university. We all have high pressure steam around. Thank goodness we haven't had any accidents, and they're not common, and they're not a reason to not have a steam system, but it is a collateral benefit. To do this, we have to lay in a whole new hot water system for the campus. So rather than convert all of our steam pipes, we're using a European shallow buried system where we can lay in a new hot water network to supply our buildings. I won't go over this, but it's in the uh, documents for those of you who want to see the configuration of the new system. This shows a picture of the new plant, which would be located on the west side of campus. Um, it involves both significant hot water thermal storage as well as cold water thermal storage. And the heart of the plant will be three 2,500 ton heat recovery chillers, uh, also by York, like Jared mentioned. This shows the configuration of the plant, the hot and cold water storage, the main heat recovery plant, and then the minor conventional boiler and chiller plant, uh, which is our backup for our Oshpot Hospital. Again, $450 million project, about half of it is converting our pipes and about 40% uh, the new power plant and the new electrical substation. We're also looking at photovoltaic power. Now that we're moving to be an all-electric campus, we're looking at significant on-site photovoltaic. We should have an RFP out uh, for a substantial amount of that soon, and we'll, it looks cost-effective. We might be able to proceed with some of that. And lastly, to um, take care of some of this heat rejection in summer that we can't use heat recovery for, and for making heat in winter rather than burning gas in boilers, we're looking at ground source heat exchange. So we have these great machines that can extract heat from water and turn it into hot water. Why not go ahead and suck some of that heat out of the ground in winter and make heat with that instead of fossil fuel? Instead of using water in summer to reject the heat, why not then put it back in the ground? For more information, we have a Stanford uh, sustainability website. We'll tell you a whole bunch more about this, as well as our ongoing efforts on, on the building side. Thanks. Well, I had two goals for today. One was not fall off the stage. I made that one. The other one was get over here without tripping off the stage. So we're good, we're good to go. It's all gravy from here on out. Santa Clara University is about 30 miles south of here. We're a small Jesuit university of about 5,000 undergraduate students and 4,000 graduate students. Uh, we live under the shadow of Stanford. But we tell our we tell our students that uh, we tell our potential students that uh, the people who go to Stanford are the ones who can't get into Santa Clara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, smart microgrid is my subject today. I'm not going to talk about details of our uh, energy saving. SCU.edu/sustainability has a great wealth of information about our sustainability initiatives, uh, among them energy conservation energy savings and greenhouse gas reductions. But I'm going to talk about one specific item today, the smart microgrid. Uh, about uh, six years ago when we were developing our 20-year strategy, a number of things happened that kind of influenced our thinking. One was uh, one that we call the El Paso Gate issue, which for some reason or another that we don't know, immediately doubled the price of our gas without any warning and with no apparent operational reason. The second one is uh, something that you've all in California come to know and love, the rolling blackouts. Uh, the third one was a, the uh, hurricane that hit New Orleans and flooded the city, and uh, the students at Loyola New Orleans, another Jesuit school, had to vacate. This campus was closed for six months. Many of those students came to Santa Clara University and did not return to Loyola Miramount. They stayed and graduated at Santa Clara. Uh, so these all went into our thinking about the energy strategy, and we, we commissioned a firm from L.A., Cisco Hennessy, 
to help us look at a zillion alternatives for how we want to proceed over the next 20 years. And uh, all of the things that we came up with centered around one important aspect, and that was developing a smart microgrid for the campus. Now there's a lot of, a lot of different versions of a smart microgrid. So I'll tell you what we mean by ours. First of all, it's a closed electrical grid like both Stanford and San Jose State have. It, it can operate independent of, of the grid or it can operate in parallel or connected to the grid. And it includes the campus load. Some distributed generation is important on campus. Uh, it has some energy storage capacity. It, it has the, 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 the single point of utility grid connect. And the, and the thing that makes it smart is the intelligent control system. Uh, we don't particularly want to be energy independent all of the time, but we do want to be able to keep our classrooms open. So we have to have a, a system that controls where our electrons go at a particular time of day. And that's the key to our smart grid system. Okay, and why do we want that? Uh, th these are a number of reasons that we think is really important. Uh, I believe uh, Joe used the term, it, 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 it promotes our sustainability goals. We'll use a different term called environmental justice, but it, it solidifies our, our foundation for environmental justice at Santa Clara University. It helps us manage our resources. Uh, it gives us a living laboratory and we have a living laboratory at Santa Clara right now where a number of people both on campus and off campus come and try out new things uh, uh, in the developmental stage. The microgrid gives us another tool for that, uh, that development both uh, for students, for faculty, and for other industry in and out of Silicon Valley. We of course want to improve our reliability, reduce costs, uh, manage our demand, uh, a part of our distributed generation, all of it one day, should be clean energy uh, gen uh, generation. And we see the microgrid as, as a key component in being able to meet our goal of being carbon neutral by 2016. Uh, finally, uh, based on the Katrina uh, lessons learned, we need to keep our classes open. 80% of our revenue comes from student tuition. So we can't stand a long energy outage. We need to be able to have enough electricity on campus, enough energy on campus, to keep our classrooms operating for extended periods of time should we have a major disaster. And uh, that, that informs us in terms of how much, how much distributed generation we need. But generally about 60% of our, of our peak demand is what we need on campus. That turns out to be about three megawatts. Uh, that's what we want to do. Let me tell you where we are so far. This is our campus. It's 105 acres. It has about 55 of smart buildings now. All of them can be controlled uh, centrally from one location. We have uh, 1.2 megawatts of distributed diesel, and we have a single uh, interconnect with Silicon Valley Power. We have a megawatt of solar generation in place that produces about 9% of our total energy but reduces our uh, peak demand by about 15%. Uh, we have another 50 kilowatts of, of solar on our building. Uh, that was our test case. And we have a campus energy management system that controls, as I say, where the electrons go. And uh, in development, uh, one megawatt biofuel generation plant uh, that will use primarily food waste as a fuel source, and a one megawatt uh, cogeneration plant uh, that meets our limited heat load capacity, or heat load needs for the campus. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Dirk was allowed, allowed on this panel, even though his name does not start with a J. Jared was allowed, even though he doesn't have the name Joe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, I want to throw the floor open for the remaining time to you folks to after, ask your questions. And if you would stand and speak loudly, that would help.
For each of the uh, slides on the pre-court website, or are there individual websites? My understanding is that the slides will be put on the uh, pre-court website after the conference, following the conference. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the impact of it. Well, yeah, uh, Bob Swenson, I am really pleased to uh, hear this from the university perspective. And Joe, you just touched upon the relationship with the students and the faculty. Um, I've been involved sometimes in uh, programs with uh, universities where there was quite a, a separation there. And I was just curious if any of you would comment about how, from the facilities perspective or operation perspective, how you go about reaching out to the faculty and the students to get an exchange going where they actually learn by doing, get the, you know, students get their hands dirty, let's call it that. Uh, was that uh, Joe's Anyone? Well, I'll take the first stab at it. Uh, uh, university operations uh, has, has, as part of its portfolio, uh, grounds, custodial, uh, campus safety, parking, facilities. Uh, in 2006, we started the sustainability program at our, 2004, we started the sustainability program at our campus and hired the first sustainability coordinator. That person is now the director of the Office of Sustainability. Uh, it's always reported to me, but it's always been housed or uh, the desk is always, the offices have always been in the Environmental Studies Institute, which is an academic institution. The faculty do not know that the sustainability officer is part of operations. I think it's part of the faculty. So uh, the faculty is very open uh, to communications with the sustainability office. That, that doesn't sound like a huge deal, but it really is. As a result, uh, the, the, the students then have a, a much easier time communicating with the sustainability office, and she directs them to us uh, when they're looking at, uh, well, okay, I want to do a project on energy needs, or what, what are we doing on campus, or how can I incorporate uh, uh, energy uh, saving devices into my academic curriculum course, then, then that ends up back on my desk, but, but that's the way to get it there. They would never walk across campus and come into the facilities building to talk to me, so it's kind of a trick. Yeah. Now, now we have a little bit of credibility and it's better off. Uh, here at Stanford, we have uh, a number of ways. We have what's called a sustainability working group that has representatives from both undergraduate and graduate student sustainability organizations. Uh, we have sustainability working teams. So when we sat about uh, reinventing our master plans for each of our services, water, energy, transportation, waste, and so forth, we established sustainability working teams and invited faculty with uh, that subject matter expertise or interest, as well as students uh, to participate in helping to develop those long range plans. Uh, out of our Office of Sustainability, which is also out of our, our facilities group here, my department as it were, um, we also uh, set up a green fund where we make $30,000 available every year for students to do uh, projects related to exploring or uh, demonstrating on campus here uh, energy efficiency and alternative technologies. Uh, so we have any number of, of contacts and, and same with professors. We've had several committees and any number of peer reviews all along the way of our planning for these energy supplies and master plans to have all the faculty with interest and subject matter expertise there to help us make sure that we uh, have all the information we can in making these decisions. So at, uh, at San Jose State, we have uh, one of the problems that Joe Sugg alluded to is that we're seen as separate from the faculty. We're part of the facilities group, so lack of credibility. One of the ways we, we are hoping to bridge that and, and kind of bring together some of the goals that we have is we worked on this this audit, uh, a sustainability audit through ACHI, it's, uh, the American uh, Society for uh, Sustainability in Higher Education. And we did this STARS sustainability tracking audit and it had three components. It had uh, operations, mainly facilities and uh, transportation and such, and curriculum and kind of engagement and how sustainable is, is uh, the foundation and uh, university engagement. So 
that was really the best way we had to, to, to bridge the gap to, to get people at the same table. So um, for the University of California, that's kind of all over the map. There's a massive program that has been organized by Joe's organization, which is the Green Campus Program, which nurtures a lot of students thinking in that direction. That's most, it's not all that technical at this point, uh, but many of the people that were involved in these programs are actually hired upon graduation, either within the university system or by the utilities, for instance, and other energy service companies. Um, our, I've been with university about five years. It's always frustrated me too when I hear the comments you're making that there's very little uh, interaction between uh, our facility management people and the faculty. So many, many of our campus at Berkeley is a good example. They have they've just started their own program and they kind of inform facility management, hey, we want to do this. But they get their own grants and they want to test their own technologies and then we support it kind of in a reactive mode. Uh, we'd like to see much more of that. There are interns, by the way, that are uh, mostly in grad school, actually, that want to work with the Office of the President because they think we are we are, we are smart or we're not. That's what they think. Um, and and then we can deploy some of those ideas to to the campuses. But there's a there's a long way to go. I, I agree with you. Uh, we have a lot of engineering students in our system that could make quite a contribution. And of course, many of them do. But you know, after they've started their companies, they're coming back and they're trying to sell it to us. So. <laughs> Sure. Of course, we get approached all the time uh, on that. The biggest technologies for us, speaking on the supply side, were, of course, uh, efficient uh, central plant equipment. Uh, a lot of gains have been made in conventional equipment, like heat uh, producing boilers and uh, chillers. We were really having a tough time finding heat pumps or large industrial heat recovery chillers. Only one or two companies in the world making them. Fortunately, we found those companies, and, and they're efficient enough machines to make our scheme work. We hope to see a lot more advance there. The other big area we found uh, was that the technology for operating a central plant with uh, any number of pieces of equipment, cogeneration, boilers, and chillers, juggling all that and doing it the most efficient way possible, um, right now operators at those plants, they're just using their best guesses. There's a few optimization softwares that will look at a particular point in time and say, right now for these loads, run the equipment this way. We actually knew that using thermal storage, we wanted to look ahead constantly a week at what the weather and loads might be and have software that instructed our central plant how to operate the most efficiently mathematically uh, by knowing when to produce and when to store and when to take from storage and so forth. So we couldn't find any software. We actually have invented it, patented in a, a startup company has licensed that technology from Stanford to then take to the industry so you can put in these really uh, forward-looking optimization programs and run these plants far more efficiently. We, we see a, a 5 to 30 percent efficiency gain just in allowing computer automation of these complex energy systems to run rather than relying on people to do it manually. So those are the big areas we were interested in. Really quick follow-up to that point. Uh, for our new chiller plant, part of the, the big controls retrofit piece of it is we're using an adaptive predictive software technology for, for controls. And it's through a, well, it's GE intelligent platform. And just, just briefly, uh, we have we have this all the time, people knock on our door. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a UC Davis graduate or whatever, and I think we have the right to uh, install our equipment, but there are actually some very brilliant moves. And I'd like to echo what Joe was saying. We are implementing something like that at our San Diego campus, which is very, very advanced. Uh, so advanced that they don't even understand it. They have to bring some other people in to integrate it. But we are definitely looking at, you know, uh, keeping the human element out of this as much as possible. Because these operations that are on the campus are very, very complex. Uh, okay. so, then we will have time, a brief time, I don't know if anybody's going to be ready for the or we'll have a question for that. Um, and then we have a question for the 
this is a very good presentation. I want to have a very good job. Uh, we appreciate that appreciate the information. And I have several questions, so I'm going to start with a very small one right now for you. Uh, for those people who have put information inside, what would your next speed cost for the government how long? Right now, if you're seeing our current uh, energy contract with Cardinal Cogen, we're averaging about um, eight cents a kilowatt hour. It's tied to the PG&E tariff by contract for us. Yeah, it depends on who you, uh, who you talk to on the campuses. Sometimes they try to suppress some of the other costs associated with the debt service and operating costs. Uh, our San Diego people, are they're, they, they claim it's about six and a half cents. But I think it's more in line with what Joe is saying, saying overall in our system is probably about eight. But, but that's just the electricity. The benefit, of course, that we do not crank in there as a discount for the heat that it generates, and that has another benefit. So the question for you, uh, Eric, is you mentioned about service the electricity costs that you were getting in, maybe 5% of our city, if you didn't want to pay back to this part of the contract, correct, am I right? That's correct. Now, we didn't go all the way to the that energy has to be savings as to be widely valued in the Yeah. Um, How do you answer that? So 50% is a very, very narrow uh, the market for you to really make any errors in that The they're not really estimates that part. I mentioned earlier that uh, all of our projects are vetted by, by the utilities, uh, the, the third parties. They're doing all of the measurement and we post all of that in a, uh, in a uh, what we call P6 database. Uh, not all of it is, of course, metered, but everything that's MBCX related, that's the one that Jared was also talking about, that, that's actually metered data and we keep track of that. Uh, regular retrofit projects are mostly there are estimates when the project starts. But when they're completed, uh, again, the third party, uh, they, they, they verify that because our incentive is based on that. So we're, we're pretty accurate on that. And uh, actually, right now, on a system-wide basis, our debt service is about 65% actually of the avoided cost. So we're, our campuses are delivering at a much lower cost than we had thought. Uh, yes, it's a good Yes. All right. So the question is that we're looking at very good at doing like the idea of this uh, e-com chiller topic and other system. What are we doing with the steam distribution at that time? Are we doing a center of steam distribution or taking the steam generation locally? We, we currently have steam distribution to serve the whole campus. We're abandoning that in place and replacing it with a hot water distribution. So from the new heat recovery plant, uh, we'll be sending out hot water about 160 to 170 degrees to heat the buildings. There's a few places where you still need steam for process, like for sterilization. We'll have a, a very small unmanned automated boiler in the bioscience area of campus that will supply those very few steam needs. We estimate steam for process of less than 2% of the total heat demand of campus. And so that's why having a steam system for the whole campus just to support the very few process needs is not necessary. Uh, well, the existing steam piping, we're, we're keeping the little pieces of it in place that we need to to get just the process steam out in that local uh, health sciences area. It's an entirely new hot water piping system we're installing. You'll see the uh, right in front of our main quad trenches open today as we start to move into phase two of our construction. This whole area of campus, including this building, is already on hot water. I'm wondering uh, if you could make a safe subject after the session, sure. those who might want to come up, uh, and hopefully not be able to watch a lot too long. Uh, $100 an hour. Right. <laughs> Before we close, though, uh, I'd like to give a big collective hand.